Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Hussam Samkari. Uh, I'm the IEEE Palos Vice Chair. Uh, I would like to thank everyone for attending this event and welcome you to our first TikTok um, on microgrids. We usually have our events in person, but because of COVID-19, we moved all events to be online uh, for this fall. Uh, IEEE Palo section is hosting a series of TikToks on microgrids. There will be more than five webinars streamed on Zoom. Um, uh, IEEE Palouse invited mm -hmm. speakers uh, from both industry and academia to talk about challenges and applications of microgrids. Uh, usually the duration of each TikTok will be uh, less than an hour. Um, and then uh, we will be sharing the information about each session uh, in the future please follow us uh, on our website or Facebook uh, and LinkedIn. Um, also, I would like to note that IEEE Palouse is part of the IEEE Region 6 um, region, which includes Moscow, Lewiston and, uh, in Idaho and Pullman in Washington. Um, now, uh, our our session, uh, our section secretary, uh, Mohammed Assad, uh, will introduce our first speaker and our first uh, event today. Please take it, Assad. I think he's muted. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our uh, our first session with introduction to microgrids. Um, uh, before I begin, I want to request everybody to keep your um, mics muted uh, and and maybe also not not have your webcams on except for Dr. Johnson. Um, it's just so that we can have um, more visibility of the uh, of the screen and you can see the uh, see the screen and his presentation better. Uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Brian K. Johnson. He received his PhD degree in electrical engineering from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, he joined the University of Idaho in 1992. He was chair of the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering from 2006 to 2012. Currently, he is the Schweitzer Engineering Labs Endowed Chair in Power Engineering and University Distinguished Professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Idaho. His teaching and research interests include system protection, power system protection, HVDC and FACS, inverter-based resources, and power system transients. Dr. Johnson is the chair of the IEEE HVDC and FACS subcommittee. Dr. Johnson is a registered professional engineer in the state of Idaho. Uh, I please welcome Dr. Johnson um, and uh, uh, thank you for uh, presenting this uh, for our web-based uh, webinar series. Okay, uh, thanks Assad and thanks Hussam. So part of my purpose tonight is to really give you an introduction on material that will be useful for the, the future speakers. So some of, the, some of the things that I'm gonna talk about may seem kind of basic, uh, but that's just uh, so that we can so that some of the other speakers are going to go a little bit farther into that. So I'm going to give a little bit of a brief introduction to microgrids, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, inverter-based resources and especially how the inverters look to the power system. And so I'm going to just give a quick introduction to microgrids, talk a little bit about control and operation, but not go into a lot of detail because some of the other speakers uh, look like they're going to be talking more about that. Uh, I will talk a little bit about common inverter-based resources and especially the voltage source topologies and their controls. And then one of the things that also comes up with inverter-based resources is um, how you control it. So do you control it? So most things that use inverters right now are controlled in what's called a grid following mode, which means that they try to follow the power system frequency and phase angle and try to uh, basically maintain a constant power or something like that. But if 
you have an isolated system, then you need something that's going to act as the sort of the frequency master for the system. And so that's when, when I refer to grid forming, and that's what I'm talking about with that. And so just a little bit of a background on things leading to microgrids. And so in a lot of ways, you can say that as the, as developments move towards re-regulation of the utility industry, or some people would say deregulation of the utility industry, there were a series of steps that basically helped contribute to where we're at with microgrids now. And so one of the things that I usually think of as one of the first key steps for this was the Public Utility Regulatory Policies Act, which is also referred to as PURPA, uh, which was passed in 1978. It was really a response to uh, an oil crisis in their early 70s. And so what it what was happening at the time was there was a lot of utilities were still using um, oil-based generation, especially in some generation that they had in downtown areas. And they were shutting those down because oil prices were high enough that they couldn't justify running them. Some of them were converted to run on natural gas. Um, I saw a few of them were even converted to run on uh, um, municipal waste and garbage. The idea, one of the ideas of PURPA was to try to encourage large industrial facilities or things like oil refineries and so on to use some of the, the steam that they already had available in their processes uh, or fuel that they had available through their processes to generate electricity and to encourage that so that not only to say, okay, you can offset your load um, and save yourself money for what you have to pay in your bills, but also be able to sell it to the grid. And they defined, there was basically a definition of a pricing mechanism that was referred to as avoided cost. So what it would, would have cost the utility to uh, buy power or run a peaking plant to offset that generation. And initially that avoided cost was set very high. So for some, some utilities in some states, this allowed them to defer building new generation for a significant period of time. And some other things that were happening at the same time was um, shortly after this was the Three Mile Island um, accident uh, with that nuclear power plant. And, and the, there was going to be more of a concern from um, acid rain from coal plants at the time. So trying to put in new coal plants or new nuclear plants were, was becoming very hard. And so having something like this to make it easier to put in for third parties to be able to generate on the utility made a, uh, on the grid made a huge difference. Um, in the 1990s, there was a significant increase in interest for distributed generation. Um, a lot of this initial interest was rotating machine. A lot of it was natural gas. So people were looking at where the natural gas pipes went and uh, trying to install the generation at those places. Um, and so we were, you started seeing this increase um, in this. And so like if I talked to planning engineers from say a Vista or Idaho Power, they were getting lots of requests from people that wanted to study what it would, what the interconnection cost would look like if they're gonna put this in. Um, as you saw, and in some areas where utility costs, where electricity costs were higher, you actually saw a lot of people starting to put in generation, especially at the distribution level. Uh, one of the big concerns initially was unintentional islanding. So if you had a distribution system where somebody put in like a fairly large gas generator or a diesel generator and the uh, main connection for the grid to the grid at the distribution substation opened or a recloser somewhere along the feeder opened and this generator happened to be able to approximately support the local load it might not trip and so if line crews came to work on the system or even just loads that were frequency sensitive the frequency would not be regulated very well and it was possible to damage end user equipment and so one of the things that was, happened about the same time as there was all this interest in developing or implementing distributed generation was uh, the development of IEEE standard 1547. And so that was basically putting together a set of standards related to uh, distributed generation. And so the initial 1547, the, the whole standard development process was 
uh, very interesting to watch. So you had um, the chair of the working group was somebody from one of the DOE national labs that was sort of given his assignment. You had um, you know, generation vendors who wanted to make it as easy as possible for people to connect generators to the distribution system. You had utility engineers who wanted something that was going to be um, that was going to protect their system uh, from problems and avoid creating difficulties for them. And then you had, um, and this will sound cynical, but you had, and then you had consultants there who wanted to make the wording kind of fuzzy so that people would need to hire consultants to be able to do all this work for the installation. Um, it took a while to get this passed. And what they ended up doing is each time it went out for ballot, it got shorter and shorter. And then they put in like 1547.1.2.3 for these sub substandards underneath it. And by then a lot of the interest in, in the, the hype had gone away so that they were able to pass these uh, pieces. But this initial standard was very, very much an anti-islanding type of arrangement. And so then you started seeing initial concepts looking toward microgrids. So people started saying, well, now if we've got this distributed generation, what if we want to have an intentional island and have sufficient local generation to support loads? You might need to do some load shedding or act more active management of load than you would normally see in a distribution system. Um, and a lot of this initial discussion was geared very much towards distrib distribution systems. And you will still see a lot of people that will say that a microgrid only applies to a distribution system, even though there are existing microgrids that involve transmission lines as part of their microgrid. Um, and as part of this, there was a, people coined the term microgrid. They're trying to come up with a standard uh, catchy term that would develop more interest. And so the, the formal uh, definition of a microgrid, if you look up the definition, this is the DOE definition. And you'll find there are a lot of slightly different definitions. The IEEE standards largely point to this DOE definition. So it's a group of interconnected loads and distributed energy resources with a clearly defined electrical bound with clearly defined electrical boundaries. So I've got a typo there that acts as a single controllable entity with respect to the grid. A microgrid can connect and disconnect from the grid to enable to operate in both grid connected and island mode. And so this is, uh, so there's nothing in this that says it has to be distribution systems. Um, another thing that, thing I'll see is some people say that a microgrid has to be, has to have just have renewable energy sources in it. There's also nothing in any of the standard definitions that say that. And so as this started to grow, this became a very active area for research. There were a lot, there have been um, probably thousands or tens of thousands of papers written on this topic in the last uh, 20 years. Uh, a lot of early field installations of microgrids were niche, what I would refer to as sort of niche cases. And these are ones that already had significant distributed generation in a lot of cases. So this might be um, an isolated load. Uh, so something that is not connected to the transmission system to begin with. And so just applying some of the control concepts for the microgrid to this. Um, also more of a move with industrial facilities since they had already grown their generation through some of the things with PURPA uh, to improve their reliability or resilience from the power system, they started looking at, okay, let's be able to disconnect from the grid if the grid's out of tolerance so that we can continue operations. Um, there was also, a, a, been a, there's been a significant um, effort doing the same thing with military bases. Um, there are also quite a few university campuses that have had some degree of microgrids. And some of this has been driven by the fact that you have uh, researchers at the universities who um, want to get grants to support microgrid resource and research, and they'll work with the facilities people in the university to help get funds that benefit the university as well as benefit their research. Um, also, another one is supporting high value loads. I think of this as sort of a form of super uninterruptible power supply. So it's something that is more than just a single battery backup system with an inverter. So it has a little bit more capabilities and supplies a bigger system. There are lots of other niche applications that you can look at, but a lot of them fall into these categories. <clears throat> 
And so the present status is microgrids are moving from niche applications. And now you're starting to see more utilities either putting in microgrids or putting in or putting in some serious efforts to study putting them in. Uh, and you'll hear about some of some things related to this from some of the speakers that are going to be coming up or coming from utilities or coming from consulting firms um, that have been involved with these types of studies and involved with some of these applications. Uh, one of the, some of the, the things that also people look at with microgrids is in some ways it is able to support increased renewable generation penetration. It also, people are also looking at this as a way of enabling new business models. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And I think we'll have a speaker that talks about that a little bit later in the sequence. Another one that people have been looking at has become kind of a buzzword. And one of the speakers in a couple of weeks will also talk about this is improving power system resilience. And you can think of this as from a, an end user perspective possibly, but some people have talked about sort of having the, the power grid river become sort of a grid of microgrids. And so these microgrids are able to act as sort of a, a single controlled entity that can help, help with the overall stability and control of the larger system as well as manage their own local system. And you'll hear more about that with uh, um, Dr. Sri Vastava when he talks later in our sequence. So some other thoughts that I've heard said with, with this often is when people talk about microgrids, you could say in some ways, we're just kind of going back to er the original power, original utilities when you had, um, when you didn't have connections to your neighbors. But microgrids are really enhanced with a lot more communication and a lot more control than you would have seen in those traditional systems. Um, there's often more active load management to be able to balance the, the generation with the load. So if you have a system that's generation constrained, um, then you've got, you need to have something that you can manage to, to have the, the load balanced with the generation. Uh, you're also seeing a wider diversity of generation types associated with these. So a generic microgrid is going to have uh, one, in some cases, more points of interconnect with the, the utility system. So you could call this a, a point of common coupling or a point of interconnect. I know there's a, some people will say there's some slight uh, differences between them, but the, the basic idea is that they're, they're very similar to each other. Um, and so at this point, this is one where it's possible to disconnect from the utility. So when this is connected to the utility, it's in some cases, these, this microgrid may be controlled. So this looks like a single controlled entity so that by using the, the local generation and storage and maybe the ability to manage the load, you can control the, the real and reactive power at this interface to the, to the system and follow some sort of a contracted connection. Uh, in other cases, the, that's not, they aren't, you don't necessarily control it that way. And so if this connection gets opened, and so usually there may be some condition based on observing what the, what's happening on the grid, you would open this connection, and then this system would become a standalone system. And in some cases, you may have, this microgrid could actually be divide, subdivided into other uh, smaller microgrids. So some people would refer to this as a microgrid. Some may also refer to it as, you've also seen some people trying to coin the term nanogrid for getting smaller and smaller slices as we divide this up. And so within this system, usually you're gonna have some sort of a, a control system that's going to manage this system and that can affect the, the um, set points for the generation, possibly shed load if the load exceeds the generation and uh, in some cases you may have a, a very centralized control, in some cases you have a more decentralized control. Um, and so you see both types of things. So you may see a frequency droop scheme for how the power sources may share load, similar to how generators on a large grid share changes in load. And you may also see a voltage droop scheme for uh, reactive power. Um, so there are a number of different ideas people have looked at and there are, as I said, there are different degrees of communication and, and control available with these. Um, generally what you see is the, um, 
the ones that have been installed in the field tend to have simpler control schemes. The ones that are written about in academic papers tend to have much more complicated control schemes. And so when you talk about components of a microgrid, you'll see different stories from different people, but basically it comes down to having some set of power generation resources. It could be rotating machines. Um, in a lot of ways, in existing microgrids, a lot of the, the early installations of microgrids were dominated by conventional rotating machines. Um, you also can see photovoltaics and wind turbines, although I think photovoltaics are more common in a lot of the installations. Some sort of controls, possibly energy storage, and then there's gotta be communications between these and then also the, the, manage, the loads that you'll be managing. And so when you start classifying microgrids, you could classify them as AC distribution systems. So 50 or 60 hertz systems, depending on where you are in the world. Um, and that's the most common definition of microgrids that people generally look at this as a system that's um, a fundamental frequency distribution system. Another option is uh, things that have a mix of transmission and distribution systems. So this is, a system that we were involved with studying for utility that has a mix of transmission systems and distribution systems. And they basically had a prioritized set of loads that they wanted to be able to support with the set of generators that they had. Um, as part of the study, um, our, the, some of the students on our team also um, pushed the idea of saying, well, how about putting photovoltaic cells on like, the roofs of some of the buildings or the roofs of uh, parking garages uh, because in this case these were actually hydro generators that did not have a lot of capacity in August and September because there wasn't a lot of flow in the, the river that they were on. And so this is an example of a, an actual utility system that involves a transmission system. We're also seeing DC microgrids or a mix of AC and DC microgrids um, and there are the voltages on these, on these DC systems range from like sort of a, a, a few hundred volts uh, to uh, 15 or 25 or 30 kV. Uh, so there are systems that are being put in, uh, being seriously considered and moving toward uh, production in China that would be sort of what they were referring to as a medium voltage DC uh, transmission system, but it also can be controlled to act as microgrid. There are also some people looking at high or low frequency AC systems, especially if you're looking at vehicle systems. And vehicle systems in this vein can also include ships. So if you think about it, uh, modern ships, so if you look at modern cruise liners, um, basically they have an electric propulsion system. So they, they don't have steam directly running the propellers. They have, they have electric machines running them. And so basically that's a large microgrid, whether it's a cruise ship or military ships, they're moving toward that as well. Um, and there's been a lot of discussion on things like um, going, so do we go to, a th do we do a thousand hertz? Do we do 50 hertz? Do we 400 hertz? So there's a lot of discussion about what's the best frequency to go with. So some other classifications from the point of view of a billing or control point of view could be, say, a, a single owner system. So for example, a university campus or an industrial facility or a military base. That's one where a coordinated control is easy because any of the generators or any of the loads are all owned by the same people. Uh, and you don't have this issue of somebody else saying, oh, I'm going to, I want to be able to control your generator. I want to be able to control your load. Um, and also from the point of view, if you have something that can normally be connected to the power grid, as well as switching off to be connected to the microgrid, from the utilities point of view, you're already a single billing entity. And so that one is, is smoother from that point of view as well. And so, as I said, a lot, of, a lot of the early applications of microgrids really are falling into this single owner category. Some models that people see moving in the future is some sort of a geographically tied group. And this is something that is a group that agrees to work together. And they may have some sort of a, a financial or pricing model. In some cases, the market maker for this might be the utility. And so 
one of the terms that's been gradually growing in popularity with this is having sort of a what they refer to as a transactive energy market. And uh, this is something that can be done whether it's grid connected or whether it's um, isolated as a microgrid. And so, but you'd have some sort of a pricing mechanism and some sort of willingness to operate and have a coordinated control scheme so that if you've got five different entities that own generators on this microgrid, when this is isolated or even when it's grid connected, they're willing to have some degree of sharing control and letting a, a master controller manage this. So one of the things that's always interesting is I see a lot of people, a lot of academic papers that uh, basically are describing this sort of a model, but they're just assuming, the, even the, the way it's written is they're assuming that some external group is going to force this control on all of the uh, generators in that system to some to the extent of saying that they want to rewrite the controls that are available in the inverters and the generators to operate in this system. But ultimately what this could do is be something that you might view as acting as a single controlled entity for how it interacts with the power system. So you might think of this as looking like a controlled load or a controlled generator. And so this is just, again, going back to that, when we look at this point of interconnect here, when it's grid connected, then if it's a, a single controlled entity, you might have something where they're managing the, the real power and reactive power at this point of interconnect uh, through the, the master control for this system and possibly even using some market functions to help enable that. Uh, and that may depend on what the price looks like at the, at the point where you're connected to the system if you have locational um, Price, pricing mechanism that's in the system. Um, but there, are, and so this is a model that some utilities are trying to experiment with. Um, there's also a lot of people trying to look at this as a hypothetical type of case. And so when we look at power sources in microgrids, you see everything from diesel generators to natural gas generators. Uh, some are utilizing steam from other processes I mentioned. Uh, you may even see some small to medium-sized hydro. Uh, one of the utilities in the Northwest has basically had a variant of microgrids as long as I've lived here. Uh, so they have a lot of irrigation ditches in their system and they have small hydro on those irrigation ditches. And they used to bring up parts of their distribution system as islands and then with those distributed generators and use that to help bring their system up. And so this was something that they, a practice they started doing in the, in the 1980s and early 1990s, long before people thought of these as microgrids. Uh, you also are seeing a lot more power electronic uh, controlled or interfaced um, sources. And almost all of these are using what are called voltage source converters. And I'm gonna give a quick discussion of those as we go forward. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these slides, so I, and I apologize if I go fast. And these could be single phase or three phase. And so when we talk about power electronics, basically you think of something that's doing power processing. So we're going to have some input power. So if it's photovoltaic, it's going to be coming from uh, a, a DC voltage and a DC current. And then you're going to process that to have some sort of managed AC voltage and current. And so you also have some power that's going in for the controls for the power electronics, and then you're gonna have a control unit. So basically you have a data processor, this thing is related to this. So, and then if you look at your, uh, at your cell phone or your computer, that's basically more like this model here, where you have a data processor, where you have input data, you put in some power and some control input and you get output data. And so the voltage source converter is basically a converter that's designed to synthesize an AC voltage waveform from a DC voltage source. And the current follows from the difference between the synthesized voltage and the voltage on the other side of um, an inductor and a resistor, or basically the parasitic resistance of an inductance that's connecting it to the system. And there are different avenues to put in control and improve quality. And these can scale to high power if they need to, but there are a lot of different topologies. But the basic building block for most of these is either a half bridge or a full bridge converter. 
And so if we have a three phase converter, we're just gonna take, we may take three of these half bridges to put them together. And so this is our, our DC side. And by controlling these switches, we're, we can uh, create a voltage. So if we have this switch open, we're gonna take the voltage on this rail and connect it to this point. And so if we just, uh, if I call this one and two, then as I switch these on and off, basically I'm producing a waveform that looks like this. So one way I could do this is just switch these on and off at say 60 Hertz and just produce square waves. Um, some of the very early photovoltaic converters basically use this sort of scheme. And then a, an improvement for this was one that looked like this. And the vendor for that referred to it as a modified square wave. <laughs> um, so you still had a lot of harmonics in the voltage. Um, a full bridge converter can do the same thing. It just gives a little bit more controllability. And so what most of the ones that use that mo this scheme do is they do a pulse width modulation. So they're going to have a triangle carrier wave that they can compare to this sinusoidal reference, and then that's going to control the switching. So if you see the weighting of the red line here, so this is plus VDC over two, this is minus VDC over two. And then if you look at the difference, and this is our remote source, that's the other side of the, the so, uh, input impedance for the converter. If I take this voltage minus this voltage, that, that causes the current to ramp up. When I'm down here, the current ramps down. So the current just goes up and down like this with the voltage drop across an RL circuit. And so when I talk about the RL circuit, we've got something like this. If we have larger converters, they use three phase bridges. So we have six of these, uh, six of these devices, or you can think of three phase legs. And so we'd have A, B, and C. And as we switch these, now we're basically producing line to line voltage differences between these points as we say, if this one is connected to the positive rail and this one is closed, connected to the negative rail, and we can produce that. To produce higher voltages, you may connect multiple power electronic devices in series. Um, in this type of a circuit, the IGBT does not have an inherent diode, so this gets added to it. So this topology goes back to the 1960s for, for motor drive applications. But this can produce a variable AC frequency because it's just synthesizing a voltage waveform. So if I take this um, red waveform and do a Fourier series on that, I'm going to get the fundamental components going to look something like the green line. So if I want to go to higher power levels, I could raise the voltage and current. I could, so I could connect IGBTs in series for higher voltage and connect either devices or modules in parallel for higher current. Um, using pulse width modulation is a way to try to improve the performance of this, uh, improve the waveform quality, and move the harmonics up to higher frequencies. Um, but it's what you're switching the full voltage and current every time you turn on and off so the losses are higher. And so you have a trade-off between how fast you switch and how high the losses get. To try to improve that, people have come up with mod modified topology. So one is a multi-level voltage source converter. So by adding this, what's called a clamp diode here, we're putting in an extra step so the voltage starts looking like this. And by putting this extra step in, every time you do a switch transition, now you're only doing half of the voltage instead of all of it. So it reduces, the, it cuts the switching losses in half. By putting this extra shoulder in it, you also are reducing, basically reducing the harmonics without having the switches at higher frequency. So this topology was actually developed for railroad locomotives originally in Japan, but has seen a lot of use in recent, in the last five years in things like photovoltaic inverters and wind inverters. Another variant is something called a modular multi-level converter. And this was first developed for battery systems and then went on to high power motor drives for things like ships. And so now we've got a bunch of these sub-modules connected in series. For high voltage DC transmission, you may have 400 modules going from this leg to this leg. You don't see these as much as the, at the voltage levels you'd see in uh, a microgrid, but if it was connected to the transmission system, you could still see that. And so if you take something like this, now what we're seeing is we get a waveform. Every time we switch a module, we just produce steps like this. 
And so that reduces the harmonics further and it also reduces the switching losses. And we even by, once you get to the point of having about 16 levels, you can reduce the voltage and current harmonics to meet the IEEE 519 or the IEC 61000 uh, uh, limits for harmonics. And so when we talk about the controls for this, generally any of the, if it's using pulse width modulation or using the control for a modular multi-level converter, you have basically two variables that you can control independently. And so you might think of that as P and Q, you might think of it as voltage magnitude or current or, or um, angle. So there are a number of ways you can view that. And then you can also, we'll talk about frequency control in a second. So one way you can view this is you could do something that's controlling, do a direct control of voltage, open loop or control or closed loop. We'll talk about applications where you want to do direct control voltage in a couple minutes. But most schemes that you would see that are used for like rooftop PV systems, for large photovoltaic systems, for wind turbines, are all using something where you have a scheme to regulate the current in the inductor. And the reason they do that is that these power electronic devices have limits to how much current they can carry and they cannot carry over current. So you can put a fault in a synchronous generator and it can supply like five, uh, five or six per unit current for uh, the length of time it takes you to, to clear the fault. Um, I know that one of, the, one of the applications for shipboard systems, they actually size their generators to be able to supply a bolted three-phase fault at the terminals for up to a second. Um, these do not have the ability to have that kind of overcurrent. Most, in most cases, the people that design these converters size them so they can do about 120% of rated current for um, indefinitely, but they can't go much above that. And so they, by doing this, it limits the device currents. And so the overall control scheme is you're gonna have, we start at the power circuit, these are our switching devices. We're gonna have an input and an output. We're gonna have a gate driver that turns the switches on and off. And then we're gonna have an inner control. And so these are the current regulators. And this is also gonna control the synchronization to the power system to follow the power system frequency. And then there'll be an outer control loop that does things like real power control or reactive power control based on set points. And we'll talk a little bit about each of these as we go. And so having this closed loop control, in most cases, uh, for most inverters on a three phase system, people will go to the synchronous reference frame using the Parks transformation. And what that does is it gives you two independent variables, ID and IQ. So in a three phase converter, um, you often have really just two independent um, currents you can control because the converter is ungrounded. And so there's gonna be no zero sequence current. And so if you go to this synchronous reference frame, in steady state, ID and IQ are gonna be constant. So as a result, your control loop's easier to design. And so it also kind of, in some ways, encourages lazy control design. So people mostly use PI controllers for these. Um, but the, by having a, something that's controlling a, a constant or near constant current, that makes it easier to do control design. And so usually they'll do fast current regulators that have a time constant of like two to four, or two to five milliseconds. And then they'll have slower outer control loops. And so this is just a, the, when I talk about the Parks transformation. Um, and so what we normally have is a, a two control loops. So we're gonna have something that takes a, a, a direct axis current reference and compare it to the measured current. So the, the, the measured ABC currents go through the Parks transformation to get the ID and IQ. And then we have a PI controller. And then we put in some scaling terms with it this IQ times omega L, ID times omega L is an artifact of decoupling the response. So there's a little bit of cross coupling that goes into that transformation if you try doing a derivative of that transformation. And so to get around that, they have this feed forward term that cancels that coupling. And then the output is basically the control reference that goes for controlling the switching of the converter.
but the ultimate controller is this fast PI controller that controls the current. And so it means that if there are an AC faults, this is going to limit the fault current. So the fault current could be right at the terminals of the converter. It could be uh, five kilometers away or 10 kilometers or whatever. And it's gonna be about the same fault current. Older schemes were a little bit different, but most of the modern schemes use this. And it's uh, generally they're controlled, so they produce fairly balanced current, so you don't see much negative sequence. Some vendors are trying to, are, to meet local grid codes are being asked to produce negative sequence currents. Uh, they don't always get the phase angle of that right, so it can also cause problems. In some cases, we also are seeing more of them being controlled to be able to supply, so support local voltage. So the original version of IEEE 1547 did not allow converters for distributed generation to regulate voltage. They had to operate at a fixed power factor. They could operate a unity power factor. They could operate at a power factor where they're supplying reactive power or one where they're consuming reactive power. One of the other things that came with the discussions of um, IEEE 1547 was getting away from the idea of saying leading power factor versus lagging power factor. Uh, because it starts to get to be confusing if you look at a, at some case where you have metering where the power could go uh, go out of, for a while and then go the other direction for a while. What, how do you define that? So now with the 1547 language, they're really thinking term, in terms of does this thing supply reactive power or does it consume reactive power? And so for supporting local voltage, it may be able to supply reactive power. And so the latest revision to 1547, IEEE 1547, uh, two years ago, put in more ability for converters to actually do more active voltage control and participate in voltage management schemes for a distribution system. And then for, as I mentioned, synchronization, they need to have some way of tracking the power system frequency. And so, the com most common way they do this is have some sort of a PI controller that's based on what's called a phase lock loop. And this actually goes back to HVDC converters in the 1960s uh, when what was then uh, the English Electric Company, which is now became, eventually became Alstom and is now part of GE, developed this for HVDC converters. And so the basic idea is you're gonna have some sort of a phase error you're gonna put it through a PI controller, compare it to a, a offset it by a phase frequency. And then basically you're gonna have something that goes like this, that might be going from minus pi over two to pi, or minus pi to pi, zero to two pi. So we could be doing zero to two pi. And there's some sort of a, a reset mechanism that will reset this. And so most converters that you see connected to a transmission system or a distribution system have some sort of a phase lock loop for doing their frequency tracking with the power system. And then you can have outer controls. And sorry about this one got a little bit big. I should have had the font smaller. You could control DC voltage. You could control DC current. Uh, you can control AC voltage or AC reactive power. And so when you see some applications for renewable generation, so if we look at a type, oops, if we look at a type three wind turbine, so this is a doubly fed induction generator so that we have the circuit connected to the rotor. And what this allows is that by putting this convert, this circuit here, you can control the effective frequency of the rotor flux. So you can make it, so even though the rotor itself may be turning slower than synchronous speed, which would mean for an induction machine that it's gonna look like a motor. You can inject power through this and control the frequency of that. So the net flux of the, what's coming from the machine rotation plus this injected current is gonna look like the machine is turning faster than synchronous speed so it can supply power. And so this, this circuit here with the two voltage source converters is basically control, basically controlled to provide power. So if this is turning much faster than synchronous speed, then you're gonna have power going that way and you inject it into the system. If the, if the rotor is turning slower than synchronous speed, you have power go this way. And the way this converter is controlled is it measures the DC voltage. So if 
the power that's coming, that's going through this converter is less than the power going this way, that DC voltage falls because you start pulling energy out of the capacitor. If the, if the imbalance is off the other direction, so there's more power coming this way than is going out this way, this voltage rises. And so by putting a closed loop voltage control on this, you can control the, vol the power that this consumes or supplies to the power system. And so that's one of your degrees of freedom. And so a lot of schemes like this are set up where you control this voltage based on a, a slave. So this is the master, this is the slave. The same thing with a type four wind turbine. If we get to a photovoltaic inverter, we can have a similar thing. But now this DC voltage is going to be controlled to get the most power out of the PV array. So a PV array is PV cells are basically diodes. And so you want to bias that diode so you can think of v, a VI characteristic. And so there's going to be some point in this, this characteristic, which is the maximum power point. And so if you bias this by controlling this voltage, you can shift the current that gets out of it to get the maximum power for whatever level of sunlight and whatever the temperature is in the solar cells. So in some cases, people will have a separate DC to DC converter here. In other cases, they'll use this inverter to control that voltage. So you can see different vendors have different philosophies for that, whether this is a three phase inverter or a single phase inverter. So that's a very fast, overview of voltage source converters. Um, uh, hopefully a lot of you have seen some of this uh, at other points in your classes. Um, these slides will be, I made these slides available to the section officers so they can distribute them if you want more time to look at them. Now, everything we've talked about with these inverters are what I would call a grid following inverter. So the grid following inverter is basically trying to track the power system frequency and it has fast control of um, the current. So you can think of it as sort of a controlled current injection into the power system. And so you may have outer loops that control real power. You may have an outer loop that controls reactive power. It's synchronized to the power system so it will follow and have fast tracking of frequency. And so one of the things that you could think of is, let's say we have a power swing that happens in a power system. So we're going along. So if, if we say that this is delta, so if we say that we have a source out here and this has an angle delta, and then we have a disturbance in the power system and the frequency starts to, or the angle starts to move, right? So we have so a classical thing that you would look at from your power systems analysis class for looking at transient stability. If we have a converter that's in a grid following mode, then what it's going to do is it's the internal, the, the internal angle. So, so this is basically looking like a, a current regulated voltage source. The angle of the converter voltage is going to follow this swing and it's gonna maintain a constant angle difference relative to this power system so that it can continue to supply constant power. So if it's in this grid following mode, it doesn't care if there's a power swing. It's gonna to try to maintain constant power the whole time. And if the power system frequency moves around at the same time this angle is changing, it's gonna follow that. And so from the point of view of someone who gets paid based on how many kilowatt hours or megawatt hours you supply the power system, this is a good way to control it. And so if you're in a, connected to a microgrid, most of the time any power converters that you have for generation sources on a microgrid would be running in this grid following mode. But if we get into a situation where the microgrid has become isolated from the power system, you can't do this because you've got to have somebody who's a frequency, who's a master for setting the frequency. So if you look at that case I had earlier where I had the two hydro machines and then we had photovoltaics that were connected to the system and we had those all lumped at one bus, but they were actually going to be spread out. You had those synchronous generators that you could view as the masters that are going to be um, setting things for the system. If you have a microgrid that has all inverters, you can't have all grid following inverters. You're never gonna have any frequency control on the system and everyone's gonna fight each other. So another thing that, um, and again, this is, in some ways this is going back to older concepts 
for power converters, uh, for voltage source converters. Um, so when you think about a motor drive, and effectively a motor drive, the inverter that faces the induction machine is acting as a grid forming inverter. But we've got uh, an inverter that's controlled to maintain voltage magnitude. It, now we have something that's setting frequency. In some cases, we can have multiple converters at our sharing frequency control. In other cases, you may have one inverter that's going to be the grid forming inverter and everybody else synchronizes off that if you've got one that's bigger than the others. And then you may even have something that's setting an angle reference for the others. And so there are some things that, some limitations that go with this. Um, this still needs some sort of current limiting control. So if there's a fault on the distribution system or the transmission system this is connected to, it's very important that this is able to limit the current so you don't destroy the power electronic devices in the current and the, and the converter. So there has to be a control loop that's part of this that limits current. And so some terms that go with grid forming opera, uh, operation is people will refer to isochronous operation. Uh, and so now frequency and possibly voltage magnitude is independently held constant. You no longer have any sort of, you may not have any sort of frequency droop or voltage droop, or you may have a frequency droop more saying, more looking like a synchronous machine. Yes, if you have more than one generator and they're operating in parallel, then it's going to be more important to have some sort of a frequency droop to, to light that they can share the load between them, which is similar to what you see with conventional synchronous machines, and they already have an inherent natural frequency droop. And so if you have multiple sources, you may have one generator or one inverter that's de designated to run in isochronous mode. If it's a rotating machine, you would want one that's larger and has higher inertia and it's prime mover. Um, and you could have, if you have that one machine acting as the absolute reference, that has some advantages, but it also has disadvantages, right? So then it becomes sort of like the equivalent of your mathematical slack bus and your power flow solution. How are you going to keep that from, uh, being overloaded? How do you handle power limits on it? If you, and so if you do this, you need to have some way of trying to do some equivalent to this batch to make sure that the other, in, other inverters and other generators in the system are able to supply power. And so you may have them some, some sort of frequency droop or voltage droop, or you could have some sort of a, a volt watt type of scheme. So there are a number of ways you can try to control these for doing the sharing. And some applications that already follow some things like this are uninterruptible power supplies when you have multiple inverters that are acting as this. Um, when you have isolated distribution systems that are fed by inverters with batteries. Um, voltage source converter HVDC schemes that are connected to offshore oil platforms or offshore wind platforms uh, or island, uh, offshore islands or uh, trying to do black start. Um, so not that long ago, uh, there was a demonstration in Europe showing the ability of using a, a, a voltage source converter HVDC scheme to do black start on, a, on an AC system. Some other things to think about with these grid forming converter inverters is, you know, consider synchronous machines. So we have this large spinning mass, right? And we have some inherent droop. So if the mechanical power in is less than the electric power out, it starts pulling kinetic energy out of the rotor and the machine starts to slow down. Uh, the first step you see to that slowing down is the change of its phase angle. Um, and so there's some inherent droop and then usually the governor will have some added droop added to it uh, or controlled droop put into it. Um, and then there's also inertia because of that energy stored in it. And so you have Typically, you have controls, you have an exciter, you have a governor with an engineered droop, uh, you may have a local automatic generation control that's tied to a centralized one. For the grid forming inverter, now we have a synthesized voltage waveform. We could have an extremely stiff frequency, so we could be able to control that frequency with like um, millisecond, on the order of uh, milliseconds to tens of milliseconds. In, compared to uh, seconds for a rotating machine. Uh, the response time is basically a design thing for the programmer. Um, 
you can also program various types of droop, whether it's frequency or voltage or even real and reactive power. Most of these have very little inertia uh, because you've got a little bit of energy storage on the DC link, but that's about it. So some of the things to think about is if you wanted to, to imitate inertia, what would you do? So some, some thoughts would be, uh, and th this is something that the, uh, they did some experiments with, with a, a PV installation in California, where as we go through the course of the day, usually the PV output on a nice sunny day, sunny day without clouds follows this. What they did was when they got to a certain point of day, instead of following this, they, they moved the reference down here and the, the inverter was able to increase or decrease its output as to, to meet ancillary needs for the power system. So basically provide frequency regulation. You could also try to do something like this to imitate inertia if you wanted to as well. The drawback is obvious with this, right? So if you run, if you're telling someone who owns an, an inverter, whether it's a wind turbine, whether it's photovoltaic, um, when with photovoltaic, you can only do this during the daytime too. So that's another problem with it. When you can only, and you get more benefit during the middle of the day than you would early in the morning or at night. But another thing to think about is you're basically paying, so you have somebody who says, okay, for the good of the power system, I'm going to operate say 10% or 15% below the peak power point. Um, even though I get paid for how much power I provide. So unless you have some sort of market that's set up to, to pay for providing this service, that's going to be a challenge. Um, another option for trying to produce this is putting in batteries and so putting in energy storage. And so that's another thing that uh, is getting a lot of attention. There's still the question of what's the payback for providing this, this service? How do you get paid for the, so you make back the, the capital expenses, the interest on your investment and your operating expenses if you put in a battery. And so battery is another thing where you could use that as your grid forming inverter as well. So some other functions that people have talked about putting into grid forming inverters, if they're even being on a microgrid, you can still have some power oscillations that can happen that you can try to damp them. When you're grid connected with a microgrid, you could control the microgrid to look like a virtual synchronous machine. So if you have inverters, you have batteries, so you have energy storage, or even if you have active load management, so you in, could increase or decrease the power from the load, you could basically control this thing to, to look like um, a synchronous machine. So instead of having something where the angle at the terminal of the inverter or, the, or at the point of interconnect is, is, so if we have something that looks like this, so if our angle difference just follows this constant value, so that we have the same angle difference here, although I didn't draw it neatly enough to show that, um, versus having something that has a response that's programmed into it to look like a synchronous machine. Um, so that's something that people, that's been getting a lot of attention um, as a way of being able to support large numbers, large, very large penetration of uh, renewable generation. And then having some way of changing modes to go from grid connected to grid forming when the microgrid forms. What sort of response time do you need when you make that transition? So some of these are, are active questions. These are really more active research. Uh, there's been, in some ways you could say that the, the large battery facility that um, Tesla put in in Australia was controlled basically to look like a virtual synchronous machine. In a lot of ways, it was more supplying, supporting other sorts of ancillary functions and not so much the, the virtual synchronous machine, but it does have some aspects of looking like one. And so based the summary, I, what I tried to do is give you a little bit of an introduction to microgrids, talked a little bit about the inverter interfaces you would see for inverter-based generation, um, talked about grid following and grid forming inverters and the, so that's just probably the main points I, I covered today. Um, I know I went through a lot of material very fast. I hopefully uh, you were able to still get something out of it. Sorry, I tend to talk fast on some of these, so I'm sorry about that. So I guess I'm open for questions. <laughs>
Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Johnson. That was a really lovely presentation. Um, before I have uh, quite a few questions I have received. Uh, before we go to the questions, I want to give um, our participants, uh, uh, the audience, a few, uh, one or two minutes if they want to ask some more questions. Hussam wanted to go over one um, announcement real quick, and then we'll go to your questions if you don't mind. Okay, so I'll unmute Hussam, I think. Or no, I, 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 I'm going to do that for him. You've got the control again? Yes. Okay. Okay, yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Johnson, for uh, the great presentation about microgrids. And thank you, everyone, for attending this event. I just want to remind you about our next event. Uh, it will be about DC microgrids uh, by Dr. Joseph uh, Guerrero from uh, Alberg University. Uh, it will be on October 8, uh, around 10 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, because of the time difference between uh, the two regions. Um, and um, we will be following uh, this event by speakers from uh, Avista, from Power Engineer, from SEL, and from uh, Washington State University. Um, thanks again for attending, and uh, I think Asad will be handling the, the questions. All right. So we've received uh, quite a few good questions, Dr. Johnson. I'll go in sequence. Uh, first yeah. question was, why current source inverters are not viable option for microgrid? And why was it voltage source converters? Um, so the, the big challenge with, there are a number of fundamental challenges with current source converters. So I'm gonna go back to, um, So if we, if we look at this sort of converter, if we replace it with a current source converter, the most common applications of current source converters are like, that where you still see them widely used are really uh, things like HVDC converters. And those use slide wristers, but you can still do a current source converter with, with IGBTs or some sort of self, uh, self turn off or self uh, commutating devices. So some problems with the current source converters is Basically, it's a circuit dual of this. So instead of having a shunt capacitance here to look like a stiff DC voltage source, it has a large, relatively large inductor here to make this look like a current source. And from a dynamic response point of view, that slows down the response of the converter. So while you gain things where you don't have to worry about overcurrent on the power electronic devices because that helps limit their currents, it does limit some of the dynamic response of the converter. It also has, if you try using self commutated devices, the, they've tended to have more issues with losses and scalability. So voltage source converters are a lot easier to control or program for these applications. Thank you, uh, Dr. Johnson. The next question we have is up to what extent uh, in multi-level inverters um, is acceptable for microgrid application? And this is uh, asking a question as a planning engineer, uh, like a trade-off. So, I mean, from, if you're coming from the point of view of a, a, a power, system, power system owner, in a lot of ways that decision is made more by the people who are buying the, the equipment and putting it in. And so the question on that is really coming down to where the, the converter manufacturers are designing, deciding the optimal module size. So the, the big advantage of modular multi-level converters is having these standardized, standardized modules you can mass produce. So in some ways, um, especially with things like HVDC converters, they used to be kind of equivalent to steam locomotives where each, each railroad would, would order a custom design of a locomotive with certain features that they wanted that were unique and the manufacturers would build it to those specs. When General Motors started producing uh, the first diesel electric locomotives, 
they basically said, this is our standard module. Uh, we're not going to do custom modules. Uh, and that allowed them to mass produce um, common designs. And if they, if they made modifications, they would have like slightly different versions of them, but they didn't do customized ones. Like when they came out with new releases, it was, might be changing some of the, the controls or making bigger, putting in bigger motors or things like that. Modular multi-level converters are the same way. Right now, the, the market that's driving a lot of these is uh, a higher power market, but people are also looking at trying to do lower, low voltage modules as well. So the, the, one of the trade-offs would be, like I showed this waveform where we're just doing single steps like this. For motor drive applications where people are using these, and I've seen some with four modules or, or three modules, they do a mix of pulse width modulation and, and doing um, um, the steps. And so a lot of it's going down to, if somebody's putting in a PV installation or someone's putting in a wind installation, it might be really, if they're shopping for the device, for the converters, it's what, what they think gives them the, the best price. And the, the other part is losses, because the, the MMCs might ha potentially have lower losses, but they may have higher cost. And the control design is going to be more expensive for an MMC, which can also raise the engineering cost that gets passed on when you buy it. Thank you. Um, we have lots of questions here. Uh, people are really interested. Uh, please let me know when you'd like to accept the last question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so one question was, uh, how voltage drive through fits in the control loops? Um, okay, so when we talk, so when we talk about voltage ride through, so that's really going to be uh, for especially transmission applications, and there's a question of where that fits in for inverter controls for microgrids. Uh, but so low voltage ride through means that it comes back when you started to see increased penetration of uh, large wind installations on the transmission system in, in um, several parts of the world this came up all at about the same time. That if you had a, an AC system fault and that caused a voltage sag, the converter controls were shutting off the, the wind turbines or for something like um, the early type one and type two wind turbines, they may just shut off because the voltage got too low. And, but that would mean that as you started having more of these, then it became more difficult from the stability point of view of the power system if you suddenly had a large amount of generation drop. And so the low voltage ride through usually comes in as part of this, um, part of doing the set points for the outer control loops. And so for something like a, a PV inverter or a wind turbine, most of the time they're going to be running at unity power factor because they don't they don't benefit for supplying reactive power or consuming reactive power because in most cases where they're connected there's no market for it and there's no penalty if they operate at unity power factor and so if the voltage falls then instead of having this uh, q reference being set for unity power factor the converter would supply reactive power to boost the local voltage and that serves to make it easier to keep the, uh, the resource online supplying power to the power system when the voltage is low if you're, if you're boosting reactive power to raise the voltage. And so the low voltage ride through really comes in as changing, these, changing this set point. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question we have is, could you provide an example case where microgrid has been used for inter-area power oscillation damping? Uh, no, I do, I do not know of one. That doesn't mean there isn't one, but I haven't heard of one. Okay, the next question we have is, an inverter manufacturer told me once that the inverter can automatically detect loss of grid and switch their mode from PQ mode to VF. Uh, 
could you please explain what techniques exist there in research that allows detection of loss of grid without knowing PCC breaker status? Okay, so <clears throat> what? So some of the common schemes that they're going to use are going to be. Um, oh, let's see if I. Um, so one is what is referred to as um, rate of change of frequency. So, or rock off. And so what they do is they measure the local frequency and if they see the, the, the local frequency starts to change. So some of them will say, uh, so, so if the frequency changes by a certain amount in a certain time, if it's a slow enough change, they think that that's okay, that's just a normal fluctuation on the grid. If the frequency starts, starts moving around more quickly and then they will trip. The, the problem with some of those schemes is if you end up in an island where you're already pretty well balanced on frequency, it may take a while for that to show up. Another one they'll do is they'll look at rate of change of voltage, uh, voltage magnitude. It's another scheme that a lot of inverter manufacturers use. There are, there are a number of other schemes that inverter manufacturers use. Some are, are passive schemes like this. Um, they also have some active schemes where they will periodically basically um, put in a, inject their own variation in, in real power and see how the, how the system responds to that. So if they put that injection in and they see a change of frequency as a result of that injection, they know that they're disconnected. And so they may do those fairly often um, especially if you start seeing the frequencies already moving around. So that's an example of an active scheme. Um, most of the vendors prefer passive schemes, but passive schemes are less reliable. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more question we have is, as microgrids become more mainstream, will net metering programs a sustainable economic model for utilities? Um, so I think the idea of net metering, um, how sustainable, how viable it is already depends a lot on, on where you are and some utilities have, have net metering programs that I think they consider to be pretty successful already. Um, others, like if you have an area where the price of power is already very low, the net metering programs are, are in some ways less viable than if you've got an area where the, if you're in an area where the price of power tends to be higher. Um, but that's also driven by other things. In some areas where you've got a lot of people that want to put in rooftop PV, you're also seeing more of a, more of a push to, for the utilities to move more quickly to, to net metering. But other places have been doing net metering for over a decade. I think I want to ask one last question is um, somebody is asking for more explanation on the battery synthetic inertia. Okay, so if we think about a power swing, so if we think about, and it's, it might be easier to think and to visualize this in terms of a synchronous machine. So we have a, if so if we say that this is our infinite bus and this is our voltage source, so if we say that this is um, our synchronous generator. And so if we have, if we have something where we have a fault on the system, so the power transfer goes to zero momentarily. So when the power transfer goes to zero, then delta starts increasing, right? And so what's happening here is we have more energy that's coming in into the machine as mechanical input, then we have electrical power going out. And then when we, when we, and when the, or we could, and then if we say that the fault match, magically goes away, or we say that the circuit breaker close, opens and closes, and so now we're able to get back to the normal transfer, now we're gonna have something that we're gonna have this oscillation, right? And if we say that 
at the same time this is happening, we can think into, if you think in terms of power, that if we look at our swing equation for a synchronous machine, so we say that this is our P sub M. And so when, we, when we're swinging like this, right? So if we have a power swing, we're going back and forth and then eventually we settle down to like this operating point or some other operating point, right? So as we're, so if we look at that versus time, what we're seeing is that this is P sub M. And so when we have the power swing, we're gonna have the, the power go to zero and then we're going to have this oscillation that's going around like this. And so if we compare this to, 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 to our piece of M, then if we wanna imitate this with energy storage, so if we ignore this part here, but get into the response, when we're here, as we go back and forth, right? One of the, we're, we're going back and forth between having power going out of the kinetic energy of the machine to power being absorbed by the kinetic energy of the machine. So during part of the swing, we're basically pulling the, the, the kinetic energy of the machine is supplying, is, is being decreased because it's putting extra power to the system. So the P electric, so this curve is really P electric, but the, and the, the original part would be PM is equal to P electric before the disturbance. And then P electric goes to zero while the breaker is open or while the three phase fault is present. And then after it's cleared, we get this oscillation. So here, basically, um, this is during the disturbance. And so the energy storage, if we're thinking of having energy storage, what, we mat what matters is after the disturbance. And so the energy, what the energy storage do here is doing is supplying the extra power here to imitate the, what's the effect of the inertia of the machine. Here it's absorbing power to imitate the inertia of the machine. Here it's supplying power again, here it's absorbing power again. So you would, uh, you would need to have enough energy storage to imitate this. And so basically you would put a control loop that you would program that uh, as a simple way of looking at it, you can basically program it to imitate the, um, the standard swing equation that you, that you see in the introduction to transient stability in a power system analysis book. Okay, uh, I think we have already uh, gone past our time. Uh, there were some questions, but I think you can contact, um, if, if Dr. Johnson allows, maybe um, you can reach them through your uh, email address, which is available on the University of Idaho website. Uh, okay, I just put it in the chat message too. Okay, it's also in his chat message, which I will share in, uh, uh, to everybody. Um, one, one question I want to ask Dr. Johnson is, uh, are you in a switching station or is a switching station in your house? <laughs> <laughs> so that's actually a picture of an HVDC converter that's been, de that's being decommissioned at the Celilo HVDC converter at the Dalles. Uh, so I'm at, I'm actually in my house right now. The, the, the buildings on our campus are actually closed right now because the air filters can't keep up with the smoke. Um, so, and they've actually turned off the uh, card reader so nobody can get in uh, the building my office is in right now. And so last year I was, as part of a research project, uh, we did our final presentation at Celilo and then we did a converter tour and they let us go down in the room where these these where these old uh, decommissioned uh, converter valves were. Well, I think uh, we want to ask um, and really thank you for um, giving this really good presentation. We didn't uh, really keep track of time because how interesting it was and. Um, hopefully we see more participants for the upcoming uh, lecture series we have uh, for the rest of the semester. And uh, I'd like to thank everybody uh, from the IEEE Palouse section, um, 
for your presence here today and uh, uh, hope to see you all next time. And especially thank you, Dr. Johnson. Well, thank you. Thank you all of you for listening. Have a good day. Good night. Yeah. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody.